Good day, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I love this. Every uh, every time they ask me uh, to teach, I, I love to do so. I'm so happy to share this topic that's uh, my passion. So I can see that there are many participants. So I hope that all of us together can share a series of situations that are changing our way of working, that are changing our way, uh, our behaviors in a topic like breast cancer, which uh, for those of us who are oncologists, radiotherapists is what we do the most. It's what we do the most. And this is a scenario that for some could be simple, breast, uh, like anyone could treat this, but no, we in a constant evolution. In the last 20, 25 years, we changed the treatments that are already obsolete and not uh, with logic, knowing what we want to do. So I'm going to try to transmit this to you. So before sharing, somebody was asking if the fast forward or five sessions is going to substitute partial radiation. Before beginning, my question is yes, of course, yes. Today, they might mean no justification to do partial. It's a polemic type topic, but yes, I like to create these questions. So now, my only uh, disclosure is that I radiotherapist oncology, so I'm always biased by these. We all know that breast cancer is the most frequent neoplasia in women worldwide and main cause of death for women. In the last 15, 20 years, we've got great survival rates for these type of tumors. And why? Because we've improved local control. This is key. This is fundamental. This is key. There is no cure for cancer without local control for any tumor, but especially for breast cancer. If there's no local control, we cannot cure cancer. If you want to think globally, we need to act locally. We all know these. We've known this for a long time. And so, for example, after the conservative surgery, four relapses, we avoid one death for cancer. But special mastectomy after, after three relapses, we're going to avoid two deaths. So in breast cancer, local control, it's going to be translated to more cure, more survival, and we are the tool for this local control. And through radiotherapy, you know, this is a highly precise uh, treatment that cures more, uh, causes less damage, and it's more cheap. It's cheaper than all these drugs that keep appearing in the market. And radiotherapy has an uh, unstoppable evolution. Since it started 121 years uh, years ago, where when the Kuri started, so over 120 years have gone by with unstoppable evolution, especially in radiotherapy. So we have obsolete treatments of 6.5 weeks, uh, week and a half. That must be forgotten. A schedules of three weeks must be our standard. Now we are heading to one week or just few minutes of therapy, and those should be the next standard. And then there's a question I would like to start with today for you. What is the standard radiotherapy fractionation for early breast cancer or what you usually do? in case of breast cancer or early breast cancer. 50 to 50.4 gray, 25 fractions, one week, two week, none. Radiotherapy, okay. You, you can see the poll, for you can, so you can answer the question. 40.5 to 42.5 gray in 15, 60 fractions, plus a boost, 2.6 gray, five fractions, and here, 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent are three weeks. That's more than in my own country in Spain. It's not like that. Even though, yes, 
we say this is the standard, this is not what we do. And I'm telling you by my experience, 20% still use five, six weeks and 13% are doing five weeks. This is very important. I cannot tell that you're my colleagues because we none of us omitted radiotherapy, so we're good. So at three weeks, you should 60%. Uh, yes, you should all have answered these because Danish and English have shown in their studies that at three weeks is better than prolonged treatments. And today, no one should admit this the other way. It's more than enough to abandon those five and six week schedules. And that's how it's considered in Europe. The recommend, their European recommendations include moderate treatment as standard. And if you look, hypo fractioning should be considered as quantity standard in the US where they have been don't want to show this result. They say that three weeks should be the routine because hyperfractioning is what leads and leads in these three scenarios, ABPI, hypo, in moderate hyperfractioning and extreme, which is the one we're most interested about right now. So what is this? Three weeks? Well, it might be a reality. This road is past. Now we're going to one week. This is what we're really interested in and what we must aspire. And then a new question, why should we always use hyperfraction for breast cancer? Not because we said it should be a standard. What is the main advantage or, or you can choose several. What is the main, because there might be several, but what is the main advantage to shorten to be more effective, to be better tolerated, cheaper. What would you say? So let's begin. So there, there are several, but which is, okay. We need to wait for 60% of participants to answer. If you don't see this in the Zoom, you can send the answer by chat. So we need to see the reasons why we should do this. It's true that any of these answers could be true. Why? Because evidently it shortens treatment. Of course, that's a benefit, logistic benefit for all. Less time of the patients at the hospital in time of a, a pandemic, for example, less uh, problems with, because it's more effective it's better tolerated yes i'm going to show you that's better tolerated although many people don't understand these and it's cheaper yes it's cheaper that's something we need to consider and at least in my country this is something we must consider so why do i think we always need to use hyperfractioning or why are we going this path biologically because first of all, we need to know what does uh, dose means in radiotherapy. And we're talking about two concepts, the physical dose, which is at number 40, 50, 60, whatever, what we place in the paper, but it's also the biologic doses, the effect of that dose in the body. And this leads us straight to this equation that you all know, the equation of bed, which has three legs it's a three-legged chair and unfortunately sometimes we forget one of them first one is that physical dose number of fractions dose by doses per fraction 40 50 60 whatever second leg to the relative effective effectiveness of the dose that's uh, characterized by this alpha beta constant and marks the sensibility of the radiation dose. And sometimes we forget that third leg, which is very important, as important as the other two, which is the time factor that's related to the repopulation factor. And it's 
it also has another constant, which is the kappa constant, that is the difference of time between the two. And this is particular in each tissue, in each tumor. So for breast cancer, alpha, beta is 3.7 grays and kappa is 0 0.6 grays. So basically, this means the daily dose that we lose to compensate the repopulation phenomena of uh, the tumor. Why? Because accelerated repopulation is one of the main causes of treatment failure. We don't understand yet how these mechanisms work, but we do know that if we lengthen unnecessarily a treatment, the probabilities of repopulation is greater if we don't increase the dose. So when we have uh, unwanted interruptions or situations where we need to compensate and we need to compensate. And so what we do is compensating, lengthening of the lengthening of time, those long, more days require more dose to compensate this phenomenon. So this is a model that I like to show, but it's not an absolute truth. This is a theoretical model, but I believe that indicates what really happens. So in these three uh, columns, I'm showing 50, 40.5, and 26 grays at five weeks, three weeks, five days. And as you can see, the equivalent day of two grades is lower in 26 weeks, or in 35 weeks. But if we apply the correction by the difference of days, so if we consider the time effect and the accelerated repopulation, we see that if we discount the dose that we lose to compensate this phenomena in the 50 grades at the end, we will have the F is effective 33 grays. Compare these to the 40 that are in at one week. So from a radiobiological point of view, in one week with five fractions of 5.2 grays, it's more um, efficient, more it has greater efficacy, or it kills more the tumor cells than a 50 gray schedule. So that's how I'm explaining that why these schedules are uh, obsolete. But ultra hypofractioning, it's not only radiobiology. Thanks to the technological advances, we've been able to arrive to these, to 3D segments, tangential, tangential with wedges. Today, we have multi segment treatments, even with volumetric radiotherapy and protons. So I'm going to try to explain my experience and how we do it. it we don't need to have protons, magnets to do hypo or ultra hypo fractioning. So I'm going to try to talk to you of where we come from, talking about fast forward, which is a confirmation and our experience and finally, some words of the future. For those of you who want to reject hypofractioning and radiotherapy to see where we are heading. So where do we come from? One week schemes are, don't start with fast forward. The British are very pragmatic. We should imitate them in many things. They've changed radiotherapy and they've changed it in a radical manner thanks to their works we started from five to three to one week in prostate we are in four or five weeks even one week and we've changed for vertebral metastasis one week so they're changing our practice but we come from more things they are not the only one at the, at the beginning of the 21st century Antoine Arasan, oh i'm sorry it's of the french they started with one week, 150 patients with a conservative surgery and mastectomy with excellent tolerance and excellent results. So, Curie, French, one fraction a week, one week, 337 patients. They compared with a classic schedule, five, six weeks, and what they see is there are no difference in the results in 
So fast trial is the precursor of fast forward. So here we have a almost a thousand patients after conservative surgery, five weeks and one weeks, one fraction per week. They, it's similar to the uh, French schedules. What the British get here, what they decide to use them in the future is that 28 grays is estimated to be radiobiological equivalent to 50 grays in 25 fractions. So this is how we should do it every week. That's what they concluded. And let's not forget that these weekly scale, uh, schedules are not new. We've always used it. We've used it in these older patients, in patients that could not uh, go to the hospitals with non-operable tumors. We've done this for many years, one fraction per week, five, six grades to the whole breast with great results and we thought it was great. But since they were older with a shorter life expectancy, we haven't given lots of importance and we thought that this was not as important, but yes, it was very, very important because this has led the path of what that we're following right now. But there's more. So we're going to go to not uh, one fraction per month, per, per week, but uh, one every other day, 11 days, including the weekend, very similar to prostate schedules. And the, Bel the people from Belgium are great with these. It's, they have very interesting papers that provide lots of information. There are many patients in these studies. So they're using 5.7 grays, even on the hips. The people from Belgium have used the scheme of ultra hyperfractioning without issues, H-I-A-I, -I, no issues in toxicity. And they've compared their five fractions versus the classic 15 fraction schedule. And they've seen that it's less toxicity. Careful, five fractions, less toxicity. This is something that we'll see later on that the password always says, also says that there's less toxicity, but when we, they go deeper in these studies, the Johai, which was randomized, they compare. This is not comparing, no, this is a randomized study that is well done and comparing three weeks versus one week with radiation of the chains, of the wall, of the breast. So we're hitting right where we want. And we wanna, and this was randomized, so be careful. And there's also less, less acute toxicity and less late toxicity. So in 11 days, five fractions, they have the same results, at least clinical results and better tolerance and risk of late complications. The authors have also made a study uh, using these in the pre-op scenarios, which is also very important to look at the inversion of the sequence of treatments and talk about radio pre-op radiotherapy and the advantages that these could provide and what they see is that there's no difference between pre and post-op. And there is, although there are less pre-op, there's less mastectomies when it's done pre-op. But as I mentioned, there's been a pass. One of the questions that we have and the studies, they call it, in France, they call it mammy flash. They all use three, RCT, they're all 3D, yes. 3D and some with 2D, yes. Yes. Simulator, tangential, the line. And the other question. Now, in your clinical practice, if you had to do a pre-ops schedule, what would you use? Well, 
we've published recently our schedules. We're in a phase two study that was published recently. And we started with three weeks because it was, it was designed before the pandemic. So if I had to choose now five sessions with no doubt, with no doubt. And what I would increase would be the boost. What in a pre-op schedule with the tumor, I would choose whatever technique you want, whatever you want to do, but I would do a PET simulation for what? To look at the captation areas of the breast and of the chains, the with 2.5 grays to all the breast and the chains and an integrated boost in the hypercaptating areas. If I can choose, okay, if I can choose, that's what I would do. If someone wants to do that, let's call me and let's do a trial. So please continue with fast forward. So this study, which was a three arm study in one of its plus parts, it's reduced to one arm because they studied, they did 45.505 gray and 26. That's, that's how they divided it. So there are clear differences when people talk about fast and fast forward. And we must know this, they're similar and one couldn't be the father of the other one. The fast has less patients, just a thousand fast forward has 4,000. And when we say just, well, be careful. The arms are different and the endpoints are also different. They were some wanted an aesthetic result the fast forward is talking more about the clinical results and they include similar uh, characteristics in the patients. Although fast forward had older patients, fast forward included patients since they turned 18. So fast forward, the evidence comes in 2016. That means seven years ago. This is nothing very new really. Time goes by for everything, fortunately, fortunately. And in this study, seven years later, what we observe is that really there was no incidence in toxicity. It was even lower than in the three weeks arm. This was a trend, direct translation of what biologically we've seen, the equivalent biological dose the bed with three weeks on healthy tissues with an alpha beta of 10 was superior to what we did in the other skin. And the authors also observed that late toxicity and septic results at three years had no differences. So in 2020, and then, well, this was the time of the pandemics. The authors decided to present these data, publish them. Here are, we have 100 centers, 4,000 patients, a great capacity, not only of uh, recruiting, but of involving colleagues. For me to find 100 centers in Spain is very difficult. But anyways, the British, were able to collaborate a hundred radiotherapy centers with 3D, 3D, very pragmatic, all age groups, all few young women, because well, that's true. Few young women have breast cancer. This is most in their menopause women. They don't have young women. It's because this is not very uh, common in young women conservative surgery, also mastectomy, re reflects the incidence of mastectomy in reality right now, and one of all molecular subtypes, 
they are less triple negative because pe patients are a reflection of what we see, really see in the society. What I don't like is the sequential boost. I wouldn't like to do a three week scheme and then in the fourth part of patient lengthening more than a week the treatment. I don't see that. I think that you lose something. That should have been done differently, but maybe that was a requisite of many of the centers to be able to recruit patients or maybe at that time it was still experimental. So the fact is that I don't like that. And also including a QT, you know, juvent, juvent and anti heart hair to patients. What do the authors find that with a mean in six years follow up, the results at seven years don't see any difference in local control or acute complications or late complications. And this scheme can be applied to all prognostic groups. To all means all of them, all of them. So the excuse is I don't use it because I don't have patients with HER2 on the right. It should be applied in all, all groups. You have to calculate the alpha, beta, that should be a 3.5, so you can justify these schedules. But there are many more works that have been done and have already published some results like this one from St. Louis that was published in 2021, 158 patients with after conservative surgery, 2.8 to 30, five fractions plus boost, good tolerance, great results. Okay, 158 is not at 4,000 patients, but look at these results. These are very good results extraordinary results and the study the results from Mayo clinics that was presented as an abstract last year it's not published as a paper yet but it, this is very interesting it's a phase three randomized study with simultaneous boost with simultaneous boost that means that we are on the right path i like it with 25 rays versus integrated boost 107 patients this is just been done for two years, so we need to wait for a little bit longer. But the most interesting part is that what all the other studies is that the acute toxicity is greater at three weeks versus one week. In other words, you don't want a scheme that if you want better toleration, better tolerance, better, more efficient, more should be one week. Many people are going to ask, what do we do with the ganglia? When do we need to treat the ganglia? Well, we need to treat the ganglia, but how do we do them? The British are very pragmatic and provide information by pills. They are are they just give the information at the right time, when they consider it the right time. The algorithms go like this, just to go on the target. And these are the results presented last year. Results of their ganglia analysis of tolerance results. What they show is present data of 467 patients randomized to three versus one week, not only of the breast and of the wall, but of the ganglia chain. And in this case, we have 50 centers. And with a mean follow-up of three years, what the authors find is that there is no worsening or greater toxicity. Careful, not only on the skin, but on the arm on the joint rigidity 
of the edema, of the difficulty of movement. There are no differences with any of the other schedules. So it is perfectly tolerated. And this is similar to the results that were published in Start A and Start B. Long-term results of the mobility of the arm and results were are very similar to these. In other words, with start A, start B, we have the same results on the arm than 50 grades in 25 sessions, then one and same thing in one week. So it is very tolerable. So we suppose, assume, we assume that this year will have more clinical results, more analysis, but until I, up to what I know in the abstract book, we don't find this yet. But we're confident that these results will appear. So more than one person will start using it. So I would like to ask now, after all these lecture, what reasons, because I'm sure some reason someone will have not to use ultra hyperfractioning, not three weeks. Why don't I do it in one week? Same thing. We have several uh, answers. I don't have that technology. I don't have enough patients, or I don't think it's the best thing. And well, others. When I talk about others, I don't know what happens they left maybe reimbursement by the insurance. But in Europe, in some countries as France and Germany, treatment is paid by fraction, by the number of fractions. So an argument that many French groups have to not use these is that reimbursement is greater when you, they use it for five weeks. And only when a price is negotiated by treatment, but not by number of fraction, is when they use hyperfractioning. So this is something that, that's a sensitive topic. True, reimbursement is very important. Okay, 60% of people answered, but I'm going to share some questions that we found in the chat. So, as you see, most of it is because you don't have that technology. Let me try to explain why this is not as important. Before going to the techniques that we know that is a very important component, we have a question that has been asked several times in the chat. For post vasectomy patients, and within that group, you show the percentage of 0.6% of patients with immediate reconstruction. Those groups was one of the uh, largest questions. And then today, do you have a contraindication, absolute contraindication for ultra hypo fractioning such as fast forward? And the other question that I know that you will also answer is sequential boost because we all have that same situation. How am I ultra hyperfractionating and not the whole breast and not that boost? So please uh, share. Okay, mastectomy. For me, it's no issue or of doing HIA after mastectomy with or without reconstruction. For me, it's the same. We've been doing we started doing these schedules due to the pandemic. So we've been doing this for three years as a routine for all patients, all, every, every single patient, absolutely all patients. So we started doing this and in patients with mastectomy with and without reconstruction. Results are exactly the same, the same as in three weeks. There's no contraindication. In fact, in the extra document, there is no contraindication to use H with or without expansor. No, there is no contraindication. So it's as 
efficient for one than for others. And the practice also tells us, I haven't seen more or less toxicity. We have, we're going to publish a, a paper with over 400 patients. And we have over 1,000 patients that have, we've treated these uh, three years. And we have less toxicity, really. And there could be epitelitis grade one, maybe a few grade two, very, very little, especially at 10 years after finishing, between six to 10 days after finishing, that resolves be before the three weeks after finishing, the epitelitis is gone. The infedema of the breast is grade one. It's true, Gr uh, bigger volume of breast have less tolerance because it, this is due to the volume always. And that's going to be this way, like it or not, obese women also. And we will see this, but I'm going to show you that I don't use a very complex treatment. I use a radiotherapy that we all have. I don't have the need of having the anchor. No, that's something we have. We've used all devices, so we don't need to have exquisite guided imaging or no. Well thought, well done radiotherapy will work. An integrated boost. That's a very interesting question. We have also already thought about doing that when we started doing 15 fractions because we thought, as you mentioned, that it didn't make sense to reduce the treatment if we are going to lengthening with the over, with the boost. And second, we, this is also something that we'd like to discuss later because it, for me, that's a passionate to do the boost in all patients, every patient. And when I say all, it's all, all, patient and let me explain why boost in the french words on the british have demonstrated significant improvement in all age groups in all all age groups it's true that the magnitude of the benefit is greater in younger women and it's true that their life expectancy is greater in young women so look at the, the curves will separate and that separation of the curves is significant in all the groups. But why do we have that suicidal trend or masochist trend to omit a treatment that we know that is efficient, but we say, no, since it's greater, we're going to not do it to the patient. But we assume that that patient needs hormone treatment and all the joints of her body will work. We'll have greater edema, uh, loss of, uh, it's going to have a dryness of all the mucosas. And we have to do this for five years. Nevertheless, doing a little bit of more of those on the two more bed, we think it's not worthwhile. Of course it's worthwhile. Why is it worthwhile? Well, it won't impact the survival. Okay, yes. For your 70 year old mother, you remove the boost and at 76, you have to do a biopsy again because she has a relapse and no treatment. Then you will think, yes, we should have done it. Because for those years that she's going to live, she'll have more tests, more manipulation, more things. So that obsession we have to avoid a treatment due to the age, I don't understand it. If you want to share your experience why you avoided, I would love to try to understand it and to, but especially to share with you that my experience says that's not true. They just published that Big 07, the Big 07, it just talks about boost and it improves the fibrosis and the hardness of the bed. But what is best or what is less? worse to have the bed uh, hardened. Well, for me, I believe that everything that I can achieve, and I told you at the beginning, there's no heal without local control. So local control is translated to survival. In Spain, life expectancy in a woman with other 
severe diseases is 23, 24 years. 23, 24 years is a lot, but the life expectancy of an 80 year old woman, of a woman with in Spain without severe diseases is eight, 10 years. So dear friends, colleagues, let's not lose our North. We have a tool that's very efficient. So let's give treatment that works. And how can we do it in the best way? Well, integrated boost is the best tool because it allows to administer at the same time. Of course, it requires um, more careful planification that you will see later on, but it is very efficient and we can do so. So let's do it. Okay, let's continue. My experience or our experience is an experience that's or is data we had got uh, in June 2022. We, we, uh, we, so right now we have 500 more patients because we treat 500 patients per year, more or less. So you'll see how we do early breast. We have San Chinarro and Puerta del Sur. We have Electa Versa, HD, Variant Edge Dynamic. And at Puerta del Sur, we have Versa HD and Infinity. So here we mix patients that that symmetry was not good due to the large volume or other type of tumors that were also in this group. We have a patient with complex dosimetries, but you can see the proportions that we had. How do we do it? This is our regular schedule, 26 gray, 5.2 gray fractions, integrated boost, five fractions, six grays, when there are free margins, 0.2 when the margins are uh, close, our constraints, are we it's it's very easy to comply with them it's easy and when the physician says we comply i believe them there are constraints that cannot be violated then we need to respect yes 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 or yes but these are constraints like as every constraints are just for guide they're there and we need to try to comply, but evidently there are always risks and benefits. To use a DIBH, in some we do so, and I do it because I have it, but if I didn't have it, of course I would still use it for, but it's not something that is obligatory. If you don't have it, you can perfectly do 3D with these constraints and it's 90% safe. This is shared by Alejandro Prado, which is our, our physicist to so choose two tangential fields that allow an adequate coverage. And we use an MRT or multi-segment technique with several segments five, six, seven segments, no more than that, to optimize three to four, in most cases, segments. In the field in field technician, technique, it's superior to the wedge technique. We we'll see that improved the homogeneity of the dose. It reduces the hot spots and was an advancement when it was placed at the beginning until you acquire at least the mental scheme of how many segments you're going to use. But there are some that allow you to have these models already and allows you to do all these planifications with very quickly. Most planifications are done by the te technicians, the symmetries, because we have standardized all these segments so they can be done in a very quick and fluid manner. We've had the SGRT system, 
for several years now, two years, that has allowed us to place the patients faster. That's my opinion. We do it faster and more accurate. And now we don't need to use tattoos. Daily repositioning is very um, safe and replicable. We teach the patient how to breathe. They have to maintain their breath to keep it within the square. And we thought it was going to be more difficult in older patients, but no, all patients can do this. It's very fast and easy. They're more invasive. The systems like the ABC that you cannot breathe and you have to collaborate. But one of the questions, it's thinking more about deep in the DIBH. Would you consider it in patients that you're going to treat that left breast? So there's another question about that left breast. Today, do you think the coronary constraints, which is something that, sh so now that you're talking deep inspiration, can you please share with us what is the difference with the left breast and the heart? All these cases that I'm sharing with you, I believe, are on the left. I think very few, very few are from the white, from the right breast. All of these are left. So we use it especially in women that have great volume or sometimes we don't use it or when there has been a chemotherapy that's cardiotoxic or neumotor, uh, neurotoxic, we don't do it. When we have cardiopulmonary disease, like neuropathy, in those patients, we don't, we use, we use a DIBH. In this case on the left, we do it with deep. For the coronaries, I draw the descendant, coronary, descendant coronary. We need to define the cardiac substructures. This is something that I think it's very interesting and I've tried to read about this. But what I've seen, at least on the Instagram, there could be no or no clinical translation. And we will see this. It's one of those things that if it's not a legend, it's very close in radio, cancer radiotherapy. Cardiac toxicity isn't, is not exclusively because of radiotherapy. And this is something that must be very clear that you all know, but I need to repeat. One of the main factors for cardiac toxicity is chemotherapy in breast cancer. It increases when you start used chemotherapy. And oncologists don't share this as much and they don't give it as much as important as, as we do. Personally, this creates great damage that you increase per grade toxicity cardiac toxicity in the paper sounds great, but you have to be real. And in reality, when you find papers like old studies that were done 40 years ago, you see, they, and last year they published a follow-up of 30 years and they've only lost 6% of patients in the follow-up. So that means they follow up 94% of all patients in these 40 years. And what do they observe? That there are no cardiac toxicity risks in patients with left breast and right breast. So these tears down all these uh, information. This is reality. Women that were followed, women that have aged 40 years, and there hasn't been more cardiac toxicity, but careful. How did they do this treatment? They didn't have 3D, 2D. 
somewhere with ortho voltage, direct fields, post mastectomy, and they got a 350 kilovolt device. And that was it in many of the centers. So careful. Today, we would cut our veins if we had to do that. But that is the reality. That is the reality. So from then on, you can think whatever you want. But the reality is that you always need to try to minimize the dose, of course. That, that must be our fundamental constraint, of course, without doubt. The lowest dose possible, of course. But patient has a cancer. And what's going to kill the patient is the cancer. So we need to consider that. Let's not forget, patient has a cancer. So these uh, patients are going to have multiple systemic treatments and systemic treatments also ha uh, have risks. Also, patient has a cancer. Don't forget that. So it's very important to check the heart coronaries, but it is more important to do the adequate treatment. And we have, we cannot stop a treatment because there could be risks. For me, that would be a greater mistake. So what do we do to evaluate the dose? Check if it complies with the objectives. No. Can we improve? If can we improve? Yes because we're not going to kill ourselves for that. So this is what we usually check in all patients. But let me tell you, best is not friend of the good. And you could reduce the dose for the right ventricle, maybe, but we need to see if there, if it's important or not, in, in, instead of, um getting complicated with the treatment so this is something we're going to show next month and publish very soon 383 patients with early breast tumors in suto all the way to t2 and omo all of them irradiation of the breast 26 grays with integrated boost then we did some 30 and 31 grades on the margins with simultaneous boost. 96% were 3D. So most of the breasts that we're going to eat three with the D. Just with VDH, just 1%. With DIBH, just 1%. There's no acute toxicity or early late toxicity greater or equal to grade three. And the M of U was 18 months. There's no fibrosis, very little incidence. So this is real life data, 383 cases. So the thing here is, is there a reason or no reason to accept hypofractionation in breast cancer yes faith 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 i don't believe this and i don't do it many times faith the only thing that translates is to this i don't do it not because i don't believe it but because this is the uh, way i've always done things and this is one of the most dangerous phases so this is how we do it that's how we need to keep doing it but faith translates to this to fear, ignorance, and this is a threat. We need to overcome this faith. To uh, overcome fear, we need to learn, we need to know. And that way we can overcome that fear. So my proposal would be the following. In low risk breast cancer, we should always do this. Uh, we should do Right now, what they're doing is all treatments with hormones, with estrogens, and when should we not do it? Without hormonal therapy, I believe we should do RTE without hormonal therapy. And the number of patients you see with hormonal therapy, we see studies of 
with hormones are more studies. So we assume that all patients require hormones. We should not give hormones and just one week radiotherapy. And if we can show in the committees that we can do this, because oncologists will say, oh, let's give them a pill and stop doing radiotherapy. We should show them that it's the otherwise. Five days of radiotherapy and no pills. So we need to talk about this. Five against five. Five days of radiotherapy against five years of hormones. That should be much, much better. And finally, very important, I want to share this. Besides everything we said about the efficiency, efficacy, ultra hypofractioning is cheaper. It's cheaper for the patient, for the providers, for the health centers, for all of those involved. We save, we save money, we minimize expenses, and with that allows us to treat more patients. We decree, we eliminate the waiting lists. So there's so many advantages. And there are many studies being done about UHF right now. They have the, there are many, many studies about this topic. So to conclude five reasons why HUF is what we should do. First of all, it should be the standard. It's already a standard. It's a standard of care. If you want to do a prospective register like what we're doing, we can just, but this is a standard for that irradiation of the wall, for the whole breast is a standard of the wall irradiation or with or without reconstruction. What else? Ganglion. Well, let's wait. But evidently, nodal irradiation, it's going, this is going to be a standard. Second place, because it is biologically, it has greater efficacy. We've known this for many years. The biology tells that great more doses per session or higher dose less, the higher um, intensity less dose changes the activation of the immune system, of the changes of repopulation, the reoxygenation. So, uh, so it is going to allow us to potentialize the effects and we can combine it with other medications because it's going to be much, much cheaper. So we save a lot compared with other schedules, other schemes. And it opens this opportunity, this window to compare, to compare five against five. So we can save money to all these women. And finally, because the only thing we are waiting or missing is, well, all we are lacking is starting we need to start that's all we need to do jack cooler he wrote down that if video therapists had waited for a fully scientific basis scientific confirmation of the efficient efficacy and safety of radiotherapy to treat the first patient this radiotherapy would have never started so Let's stop thinking so much, waiting so much, because there's not enough patients, because maybe they're triple negative, or because not enough right breasts haven't been considered. No, let's look at the evidence. We know what we're doing. We need to do it, so let's do it, please. And here I leave you a couple of references, bibliography. If you want to learn more about these topics, you should read these papers. And here I also 
leave you my email, all my information. I would love to answer any questions you have. So, uh, but now let's move to the questions. Excellent presentation, Dr. Monteno. I'm like speechless. Thanks for sharing all your experience and what you've done with UHF because it really uh, asks or, or it questions us. So there's someone who raised their hand. So let me give the floor to Diego Juarez. Yes. First of all, thank you. Second, congratulations. We've read about you. And it's very clear what you do. Now, what I told you, the first question, are you going to substitute? Is HFU is going to replace partial? Yes, partial radiation is going to be, it's the past, especially in patients with low risk characteristics. Those that we don't have to implement more technology either. We need to optimize the accelerators, the boosters we already have. Another interesting idea that was used in some centers that has been described, it's nothing new, is conservative treatments of breast, giving a first external radiotherapy treatment and then interstitial uh, brachytherapy. There are series, I don't recall them right now, excuse me for not recalling the authors, where they also tried to do this. And in the cases where it was indicated irradiation of the internal mammary chain, especially on the left. Me, I, for example, in the public center I work with, I don't have respiratory contention methods, none. When I have to radiate the internal mammary, I have to be more careful. Only in the cases where I have to radiate, uh, apply radiation to the internal. So second, it's going to substitute partial radiation, second, that an institutional boost, and third, patients with indication of internal radio. So what would you do in these three cases? Thank you, Diego, for your interesting question. Well, brachytherapy boost, I've done a lot in 20, in 2012, 2013, we did it as a routine in all patients. But when we started to use the boost, we realized that it was an advantage because boost with radiotherapy, the patient had to wait three weeks because it required manipulation, anesthetic, it required a series of additional maneuvers that would delay the treatment and it would one or two weeks later. Also, la intraoperatoria. Pues no lo sé. A mí la intraoperatoria siempre me genera dudas porque I don't know it because it always causes doubts. It has. Well, in the surgery we do something. They were not good enough because there was greater possibilities of relapse. And in the Italian series, what they've shown, even in low-risk patients, the relapse rate on the bed was the same. So this makes us think, think that maybe it's not as safe. And in the US, for example, it was recommended only in the clinical setting. Sinceramente, en mi opinión personal, yo eh, la parcial no me gusta. Me gustó en su día, en los años 2000, cuando se creó, porque comparaba una semana de tratamiento versus seis semanas y media. Era una buena ventaja, ¿no? Pero a día de hoy que tengo... advantage, but today, since I have a complete radiation of the whole breast, which is very simple to do it in one week, it doesn't require lots of issues. It is routinely done with no problems. It doesn't require specific uh, devices. I provide, I would like to do the whole breast, not partial. Uh, partial, just in the case of us where we need to do a partial in very few cases. 
and doing the internal. Yes, it's done in some patients with internal and I've done interstitials, but I do them because I've seen that it can be done. There's no issue. The heart is okay. So I think that in just very specific cases, there will be issues. So the internal mammaria could be another presentation because it's it's a still a debate. And to do UHF in internal mammaria could be uh, 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 another speak another lecture of radios against uh, contra cancer. So Gangler, in the notes in general, you, you that follow up of the radiation or oh, fast forward is very little, two years, but I know it will continue giving us more information. And in following years, we'll have more to share about this topic. Someone else raised their hand. Hi, doctor. Good morning. Excellent lecture. I am from Peru, from the National Institute of Neoplastic Diseases, and shared that we have moderate 15 sessions radio fractioning. We started and we, we did great. We started in locally advanced because our casuistic is high. We had a few mentions uh, in the articles in the papers that we've had great toxicity less that with conventional fractioning. We started doing 2D as you mentioned, two tangential plates with contour and a 2D planification. Then when we started the, with a third 3D technology, the volume was so high that we only took a reference CT and we maintained our constraints. And we did the same thing, two tangentials, 3D. And we've advanced doing the contours of the margins, the limiting the areas. And when we started to follow the guides, just as as their experience, that contour of the breast, following the constraints of the RTOG, those tangential fields that we did in 2D have broadened. And when we take those tangential fields, we didn't go 1.5 to the breath, to the lung, but even more. And it complicated our experience because with that data of having 2D, without, when we started doing CT, now at the service, we don't do 3D and we are doing many in Vima patients. So I'm always questioning these, irradiating the cells because there are cases where we've tried to go to fast forwards and we haven't complied with that dosimetry because those little tails to involve the HD that you go too much to the lung field and if it's the left, you go a lot into the heart. I would like you to explain to us about your experience in the contour if you omit some of these areas. And just also to share with you that we at the department have never irradiated the internal mammaria and our relapse state, our relapse of the internal is very low. We haven't published due to the great volume of patients. We treat 1500 patients with breast cancer per year and we have a very crowded service and I'm going to share with you, I'm going to write to you so we can work with you in that is key for, two, for breast. We still use 300 per fraction, but it would be interesting to go to more hyperfractionation. So I would like you to explain to me or to share with me, what are you doing with that contour with the margins? Because for us, this has been a complication. Thank you very much. It's true, it's true. We follow the strong guides that are a little bit different than the RTOG. And maybe that's the reason why, or maybe because we do it in a more pragmatic manner. And we've learned that many times sacrificing those tails or not being as strict in those edges allows us to have a better dosimetry. And really this is something that has been described. It's written and many times adjusting the dose in these edges allows 
us to have a, a, more, a, a greater confirmation or less problems in the treatment. And we haven't had many issues with this. Yes, it's true. If you, well, maybe the, our way to define volume is more adjusted to the, than the RTOG G guidelines. So, but I use more that some guidelines and with days, we have very few issues. Internal memory, a memo, memory is a, 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 a topic that um, could, well, I believe we should not include them all. When we see these, there are very few cases with these. RTC give us a relapse rate of the internal memory of very, that are very, very low, 3%. But it's true that the internal can be as a, a focus for no metastasis before a focus where we anchor these metastases. So including them probably will have benefit. Not in all, but we're including them, the internal memory in patients with N2 and N3 axillary involvement or young women with women with central quadrant volumes or large internal tumors, but not as a routine. We don't do it because I believe that doesn't make sense. To the French, well, in many centers, they routinely did it and they never uh, uh, demonstrated better results, or improved results. So I don't think we have to kill for those. The internal memory should be an, an issue, but we need to adjust our radiation volumes. I do believe that's more important and also the location of the breast maybe well we use that in, inclined plane but there are other systems with alpha wedges and sometimes that could allow us to make it to go down a little bit more maybe that's it it all depends of the volume of the volume of the breast so we haven't had issues really it, it that hasn't been an issue um, so that's so like that's not a reason to admit age of symmetry. Yes, that's one of the questions. Those large breasts that sometimes you have issues, especially for UHF, because of the tail on the contour, you go all the way back and you do a long or a hard dose, depending on the laterality. So it's interesting. One of the question was if have you ever used the prono in the largest ones? Prono, the French use the lateral cubitus, which is absolutely different. So, what do you think about pronos on those large breasts? I like that. I published that I designed a system when I did it in Ramon and Cajal. We designed a device to immobilize patient. Don't use it anymore, but the best position for to avoid the heart and the lung is on, in prono. The best one. Prono has issues for the chains, but there are solutions. When I worked at Ramon y Cajal, we had less hypotelitis. But if I had a prono immobilizer, I would use it. That's what I would use. So this is an invitation for the, those of you who have these. In, it would be excellent to use it. But here, I would like to have a large conclusion, the boost in two particular points. If you are starting and you have to do a boost, the boost criteria that you use are the astro guides that we all know, grade three, patients younger than 50 or positive close margins. And the second question, it's related to, okay, if I'm going to start, is it better to do that additional session of 5.2 grace just at the bed, or should I try to do it integrated simultaneous? Because the boost generates lots of controversy with a fast forward. So I would like you to give us your conclusion. Okay, I'm going to, okay. My conclusion for boost is, when do I give a boost? 
Here, here it is. I wrote it. All, all. Why? Because there's a benefit of boost. In the astro and all the criteria, there are many and they're good, but I still don't understand them. Why, as an oncologist, should I renounce to a beneficial treatment? Based on what? Based on what? Should I not do a treatment that provides local control? And I know local control provides survival. And I know it because many studies have showed it. And this is a well-tolerated uh, treatment. So why should I renounce? Uh, no, I don't understand why I should not use it. And nobody has, when somebody explains me why, maybe I will. But evidently, what we can think about is the doses we need to use. And the 10, 16 grades, RTC says it's just a, a study, a trial. But there are a thousand ways one fraction, bracky, intra, variable doses. But increasing the dose is good because we all know that between 85 and 100 percent of uh, relapses are on the bed so we need to minimize this second how would i do the boost well until recently boost simultaneous boost is experimental so it was no issue for us the first person i person i heard was dr cornetti in new york and I use 3.2, 3.4 when the margin is very close. And we did similar things. And then we went to the literature. Well, we did it. We saw that the Belgians used a similar schedule and other universities had used something similar. So we didn't thought it was crazy to use integrated boost. Uh, we've known by other treatment that in five fractions, in higher fractions, it was great. It works great. And we're satisfied to do brachytherapy boost in older women. Well, I can understand it would be better not to put, take her to the to OR. But if I had to start to uh, working now, I would do integrated boost integrated boost can be done and is efficient in 50 sessions no doubt in five sessions two i will do a prosthetic registry but don't exclude women of this benefit we accept the hormonal hormone therapy but we know that a 65 70 75 year old woman with hormone treatment has very poor results we see it in the literature it happens in the u.s so it must happen in europe and latin america women with in situ carcinoma the insert study said that a five years hormone treatment complies just 35 percent of them comply two-thirds abound on this treatment and uh, they don't tell the physician because they are, they feel bad, but they abandon it because they don't tolerate it. And this is in the in situ. Instead of 20 milligrams, would have done five milligrams with the same efficiency, maybe. So I have no doubt. With radiotherapy, we should cure as much as we can, boost whatever we need because we know what's going to happen with radiotherapy. We know the tolerance, we know what can happen. We know how to minimize the risk. So let's do so. We have technology to do that. Thank you, Angel. It was a pleasure and a great day for all of you.